Hello, my name is Eduardo Dixo. I'm a senior data scientist at Continental, and today I'm going to talk to you about object detection using CNNs and transformers applied to images recorded by datasets. First, I'm going to introduce the task of object detection and also the dataset that we'll be using. Next, we'll see some common CNN-based architectures like the FASTRR CNN and the RetinaNet before discussing the transformer and seeing how the detection transformer performs on our dataset. So let's begin by first introducing the task of object detection. Task of object detection can be uh, regarded as given an input image, we want to find all the objects that are present in that image. So we need to spatially locate them uh, using bounding, box, bounding boxes and also we need to classify them into a set of predefined classes. If we compare the task of object detection with the um, image classification, for example, in image classification, we usually have a single main target in object detection. We may have different number of objects uh, present in that image with different poses, with different scales, and this makes the task uh, very challenging, more challenging than the image classification, for example. The data set that we are going to use is the Vice Drone data set that contains nearly 6,000 training images and 500 validation images. It also contains 10 categories from which we are only interested in cars. We are going to build an object detector for uh, detecting only one class, which will be cars. And this data set is interesting because it rec records the images and the different conditions like different weather, different lighting, different uh, object density of the scenes, different scales of the objects. We have some fast motion artifacts because of the movement of the cars or the movement of the drone during flight. And also the bounding boxes are annotated for occlusion and the tr truncation. Um, some applications of training such an um, object detector could be interesting for um, road safety, traffic monitoring or even uh, driving assistance as finding free parking uh, slots. First, we make a distinction between the one-stage and two-stage object detectors. A two-stage object detectors contain uh, a region proposal network that will output uh, high confidence region proposals uh, that should contain an object on it. So it's not concerned where, uh, which the, what is the class of the object in it. It's only concerned if there is an object or not. And then the object detector head that typically does um, bounding box regression for finding the position of the object and object classification to find its class can attend to these proposed regions. And by doing so, it will it will have a much smaller set of candidate regions that might have an object. And, by, and it, this will eliminate many of the false positives that we would have otherwise. A one-shot detector, on the other hand, uh, generates a dense sampling of possible object locations. So it will generate lots of object look, candidate locations with different shapes and different aspect ratios. And it will process them directly to learn the class labels and bounding boxes. The first model that we are going to discuss is the faster RCNN. The faster RCNN is a two-stage object detector that employs two modules, a regional proposal network, and also the classifier head that does the bounding box regression and object classification. We will start by following the typical data flow of the image as, as it goes through the architecture. So the image goes through the backbone. The backbone goal is to extract high-level semantic feature maps from the image that will be useful later for the region proposal network and for the classifier. This can be typically achieved by any of the shelf convolutional architecture like um, ResNet or VGG. As the image uh, goes through these several convolutional layers, it gets uh, down, down sampled. So it will have a smaller width and smaller height, but much more depth, meaning that the, the feature map of the last stage of the, of the backbone uh, will have uh, many channels. Next, we have this region proposal network. This region proposal network will predict the object bounds as well as the objectness scores, meaning if it has an object or not. And it's a fully convolutional network. It will, it will receive as input the feature maps from the backbone. It will slide the window over these feature maps. At each point of the sliding window, it will generate k anchor boxes. The number of anchor boxes is parameterized by this, by this k. And it will have uh, two sibling networks for the outputs, one that is two times the number of anchor boxes for the um, 
for the score classification in foreground and background and the other one will be four times the number of anchor boxes for the bounding box uh, coordinates finally now we have a set of regions pro uh, proposed by this region proposal network module and in a very naive way we could simply crop the image using these these, these proposal regions and feed it into another classifier uh, just to get the object class. However, we want to make this end-to-end -end and to reuse the feature maps that we have computed from the backbone. And for doing so, we are going to map the feature maps to the proposals of the region proposal network using this region of interest pulled in layer that will extract then fixed size feature maps from each of these proposals from the feature map. The reason these are fixed size is because we are going to use a fully connected layer that expects fixed size. Then we have this classifier that will predict the object, the object class as well as the bounding box coordinates. We are going to use the Detection Tool Library, which is a PyTorch-based deep learning uh, frame, framework for object detection and also semantic uh, segmentation. And we are going to use uh, faster RCNN with a ResNet 50 backbone using fully uh, feature pyramid networks. The reason we are going to use these feature pyramid networks is because we have images in our data set that are that have very small scale. So we have small cars and also large cars that we want to detect depending on the altitude that the drone is flying. And by using these feature pyramid networks, we can improve the multi-scale object detection because the goal of the feature pyramid network is to build these high-level semantic feature maps across all the pyramid levels from a single image of uh, a single uh, resolution. This is done by... Uh, merging the bottom-up pathway, which is the the feature maps from our CNN backbone that then are upsampled through this top-down pathway and merge through lateral connections uh, in the feature pyramid network architecture. For training the faster RCNA, the first step is to register our data set. We do this so that the, uh, the detector 2 knows how to obtain it. Um, if we already have the annotations in a JSON uh, COCO and, and, uh, format, we can use the register COCO instances directly. In this case, we have prepared the annotations in these formats. So we can use the register COCO instances, and we also pay, pass the um, base path image so it knows where to fetch the images from. Next, the Tectron 2 uses the key value uh, config uh, system based on YAML files that uh, provide already some common functionality and operations. If we require more advanced features, we can drop down to the Python's API or also derive uh, from a base config file and implement the attributes. And in here, what we are going to do is first we load the default configuration file. We then inherit uh, from the configuration file of the model that we want to fine tune. We specify the training and test data sets that we already registered previously. We specify the number of workers for the multiprocessing part. And we load the pre-trained model weights uh, from the Detectron 2 model zoo. Then we have the learning rate, the maximum number of iterations, the batch size, and the steps at which to decay the learning rate. All of these are very important parameters that we should uh, tune to get the best uh, metrics, but also to, to squeeze the, the best performance out of the GPU. And then we specify the number of classes for uh, this particular uh, architecture, which is one, because we are only interested in detecting uh, cars. Finally, we can launch the training using the default trainer class that provides out-of-the-box standard training logic. If we require, we could also implement our own uh, Python training loop or also subclass this default trainer. In here, since we are not loading from a checkpoint, we pass this reason equal false. R now we take a look at the one stage uh, detector. So RetinaNet. RetinaNet is a powerful one stage detector that employs the feature pyramid network that we have seen before that helps with a multi-scale 
um, detection of the objects and also to uh, classification to classification two sibling networks one for classification and the other for bounding box regression the one stage detectors were typically regarded as being faster than the two stage but they were lagging the accuracy of the of the two stage detectors so the authors of retina net attributed this to the eye class imbalance between foreground and background that may happen and the reason if, is if you remember these uh, one shot uh, these one stage detectors they will sample a, a large set of candidate regions many of them will be background will be easy negatives and they will not contribute with a useful learning signal uh, for the network or they can even uh, overwhelm the the training loss so what they propose is this novel loss called the focal loss that uh, adds this modulating factor to the standard cross entropy and it will downweight the well classified examples uh, so that the model can focus more on the other examples for the retina net we are also going to use a resnet 50 backbone uh, for comparison with the faster rcnn we also use the detector and tool library for doing so uh, registering the data set requires no changes, launching the training also requires no changes, but we need to change the, conf the, the configuration file. So in this case, we need to inherit from the appropriate model. We also need to load the appropriate models from the model zoo. And now for setting the number of classes, we need to, uh, to access a, a different attribute of the config, which is under these retina net uh, num classes. After training both models, we see that they uh, both have good uh, cocoa evaluation metrics. We are using the average precision, uh, which basically uh, penalizes uh, missing detections and also detecting uh, having too many duplicate detections for the same object. And we see that the average precision is very similar uh, for each model. In this case, the retina net is uh, better at detecting uh, larger objects but worse at smaller objects but if we look at the average precision they are very uh, equally matched and also the inference results as well another thing that is commonly commonly uh, in, employed in computer vision is that augmentation for aiding in the generalization of the um, of the network and the reason is that we want our object detection to work under different lighting viewpoint scales etc so we can generate an augmentation policy that will bake these transformations there and so we pass our data set through this augmentation policy in reaching our data set that we will then use for training our model. Uh, in this example, we have an horizontal flip and also some, we, we can see on the left, the, the, the augmentation policy used and also some random brightness, some random saturation, some random contrast. Uh, for, using this transform, for using this augmentation policy, we use this uh, that takes a data set we use this data set mapper that takes the data set in detection two, and then we map uh, our data set into a format that will be used by the model, which is this uh, dictionary with the keys, uh, I to read image uh, instances. So we load the, we, we, read, we read the image, we transform it using the, aug the augmentation policy that we have defined. We also need to be careful uh, for transforming as well the bounding boxes, and then we to of generating the, the data in the form that the model expects. But we are not limited to use uh, augmentations only from detection tool. We can also use, integrate external libraries like Albumentations or Cornea. And these libraries uh, have a very large uh, collection of transformations that are not readily available in the in detect, in detection tool, like this random sandflower and that we can also use. Um, one comment is that we used uh, um, data augmentation for training the faster RCNN and the retina net, but we didn't see uh, improvements even when training for uh, more uh, iteration steps. Now, we, we will discuss the transformers. The transformer was originally proposed as a sequence to sequence model for machine translation, and it is now a standard in natural language processing, but also it has found its way into computer vision and other tasks. It's a very general purpose architecture that lacks the inductive biases of CNN, for example, the locality and translation invariance. But given large enough scale data, it can learn this from the data and, and perform on par or even surpassing the CNNs. The vanilla transformer uses an encoder and a decoder. 
the encoder has two modules uh, and the decoder, the multi head self attention, and the feed forward network. And we employ around each module uh, a residual connection and also layer normalization. The decoder also uses cross attentions. So in this cross attention, the keys and values come from the encoder and the queries come from the decoder. And we also uh, have, when we talk about differences between applying these transformers from NLP to visions, we have these differences in scale and resolution. Scale being that in NLP, the words serve as the basic elements of pre-processing. But when we're talking about object detection, the objects may vary in scale, so they may be comprised of a different number of pixels. And resolution, if we think that, uh, for example, the images are comprised of a lot, uh, a big number of, of a large number of pixels. Uh, since the self-attention is very central to the transformer, let's see what makes it so appealing uh, when compared to other layers. Uh, we see that self-attention, so in here this table on the bottom left, the T stands for the sequence size and the D stands for the representation dimensionality of each part of the sequence. And we see that self-attention is more parameter efficient than fully connected layers, as well better at handling arbitrary uh, variable input sizes. And if we compare this to recurrent uh, layers, it's also more parameter efficient if the size of the sequence is smaller than the representation dimensionality. When compared to convolutional uh, layers, uh, convolutional layers for achieving a global receptive field, meaning that every pixel would interact with every pixel, uh, we typically need to stack many of these convolutional layers on top of each other. And in self-attention, all parts of the sequence interact with each other uh, within a single layer. Let's take a look at how the self-attention works. So the self-attention um, relates different positions of a sequence to compute a different representation of that sequence. So we feed it as an input, uh, a sequence Z in this case, of uh, size T and dimensionality D. And we compute three matrices, the queries, keys, and values. We do so by multiplying the input with this matrix uh, U, Q, Q, V and slicing along the last dimension, the dimension of the tree times the dimension of the head. And this will generate the queries, keys, and values for us. Next, we compute the dot product between the queries and keys. So the queries and keys must have the same dimension. And we divide by a scaling factor to alleviate vanishing gradient problems. We apply a soft max in a row-wise manner. And this will be um, our attention matrix that has size t by t. So it's quadratic to the size of the input sequence, which is one of the bottlenecks of the transformer. And then we multiply this by v, uh, our matrix value, to retrieve the, the, final, um, the final computation. However, the self-attention, does the transformer doesn't use the regular self-attention, it uses a generalization of it, which is called the multi-head self-attention. Multi-head self-attention is an extension of the self-attention in which we run K self-attention operations in parallel. So we, we run many self-attentions in parallel, we concatenate them, and then we do a linear projection uh, again to the dimension D to not explode, to not explode the, the dimensionality. Let's now revisit the transformers after having seen how the self-attention works. So uh, in the original uh, transformer, we had an encoder and a decoder, but we can al also use only a part of the architecture. For example, architectures that only use the encoder part like BERT uh, are, imp are important when we only want a global representation of the sequence and you want to build classification on top of it, for example, for performing sentiment analysis. Um, when we architectures that only use the decoder are used for language modeling like GPT-2, and we also have architectures that use both the encoder and decoder, uh, like the detection transformer that we'll see next. Um, a fact that is also important is that self-attention is invariant to the position of the tokens. So it's very common to uh, add these position encodings to the input so that the model can reason about the, the, the positions of the, of, of the parts of the sequence um, during the, during the, the self-attention and, and the, in the encoder and decoder blocks. And now we are going to talk about the detection transformer. The detection transformer is a very simple architecture that is based on a CNN and a transformer decoder architecture. And 
it uses a CNN backbone, so we we feed it an image, and this image goes through the uh, through the through the CNN backbone and generates a, f a feature map with lower width uh, and lower height, but with a much deeper um, number of channels. And now we have this this tensor of width, height, and channels, but we want to feed it into the transformer encoder, but the transformer encoder is expecting uh, a sequence. So the way we can do this is by flattening the spatial dimensions of the of the input by multiplying the height and width, and then we can feed it into the transformer encoder. Then we have the transformer decoder that has these uh, object queries which are learned uh, by the model as, uh, as the input. And these object queries are the number of objects that we are trying to detect in an image. So it must be set uh, to be larger than the largest number of objects that we have in an image to provide us some slack. And they will learn to attend to specific areas and specific bounding boxes sizes in an image. Then the decoder is also conditioned on the enco encoder output. And we predict uh, the classes, uh, the object class and the bounding box through parallel decoding. So it's not in an autoregressive way. We output them in parallel and we are treating the object detection problem as a direct set based prediction. So we need an appropriate loss for that. They use this bipartite matching loss based on the Hungarian algorithm that is permutation invariant and also forces a unique assignment between the ground truth and the predicted objects. We are going to use the Egging Face library that contains many transformers, and they recently added the visual transformers for image classification, like the visual transformer VIT, and also this detection transformer for object detection. They also they added this to the library, and we are going to use based on a ResNet 50 backbone. The reason we use this dilated convolution is that the dilated convolution will in, uh, increase the resolution by a factor of two at the expense of more computations. And, but it will help detecting uh, small scale objects. Again, Face provides a very um, comprehensive set of documentation. It also explains the internal part of the model. And we also have these ex uh, example notebooks by Niels Rogue that are linked at the page and at the bottom of this slide that explains how we can fine tune the detection transformer in our custom data set. So, Again, Face is these um, three classes, the feature extractor used for pre-processing the, the, the input for the model or for post-processing the output of the model in the cocoa annotation format, for example, for running the cocoa evaluation matrix. We also have the, the data for object detection model um, that exposes um, the, the log hits and the prediction boxes. And also we have this data config uh, that can be used for instantiating uh, a data for object detection uh, model through this configuration. The modifications that we do in this, uh, if, uh, when compared to the notebook is that we use the ResNet with dilated convolutions instead of the ResNet 50. We also set the maximum size of the image to 1100 to not eat good out of memory errors. And we also use a smaller batch size of 2 instead of 4 uh, because on V100 GPU we use get uh, out of memory errors otherwise. After training the detection transformer on our data set, we see that the average pre precision is very, very poor compared to the object's uh, detections uh, are b based on CNNs we have seen previously. The model is able to detect large objects. It has a, a, a fairly uh, good average precision for large objects, but it is very small for small and medium objects, uh, which can be attributed to the detection transformer not being suitable for these small scale uh, object detection problems. And as feature pyramid networks did for CNNs uh, for helping addressing this multi scale object detection problem, uh, similar approaches could also help improving the detection transformer further. Uh, we see in the inference results we have some duplicate. Um, some duplicate detections that could be probably removed by using non-maximal suppression. And we also have some uh, missed detections. So how can we improve these results further? We can, for example, scale the backbone. In all of these experiments, we use the ResNet 50, but we could use a larger backbone like a ResNet 101. Um, the results we had for the documentation didn't improve 
uh, didn't improve our results, but we could add fine tune the probabilities or also uh, change the, the augmentation transformations to, f to, to find if we could get better results. Uh, right now, we also have more publicly available um, data sets recorded by drones like MIVA, UAVDT, and so on. And we could use this to build uh, a larger data set to see uh, if we can get uh, better results out of this. Also, we only used uh, static uh, images for the object detection part. But if we think about video object detection, we can exploit these um, temporal cues uh, of the different frames to reduce the number of false positives. We also have different transformer architectures, for example, the, the swing transformer or the focal transformer that could be used and, test, and tested to see uh, if they provide uh, better results. To conclude, we see that CNNs make for very powerful baselines. We used off-the-shelf pre-trained uh, CNN architectures, the faster CNN and RetinaNet and got very good uh, average precision results in this drone for detecting cars. The transformer architectures are being increasingly used uh, in research and practice, and we can see that they are being added to these mainstream libraries, like Hacking Face, for example. The detection transformer is better suited for medium to large, um, to large objects, but developments similar to the feature pyramid network um, as it, as it was used for CNNs can also help uh, the detection transformer. And the transformers will continue to be used into uh, downstream tasks like object detection, image classification, image segmentation. We can see many research papers coming from these areas. And last but not least, uh, transformers make from an unifying framework uh, for different fields. So before we encoded all of these inductive biases that we have for the CNNs and for the LSTMs. On the other hand, the transformer makes for a very general purpose architecture that lacks these inductive biases, but it can learn them from uh, large scale data. And it has, it has given very good results for natural language processing. And it's now also giving some uh, state of the art results in image. And so it can maybe unify both fields and also uh, unify the practitioners and researchers from both areas. So today, um, this concludes my presentation. Uh, I want to thank you for listening.